Thank you, Pastor Ken, for reading those scripture verses. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Holy Father, this is the message you've laid on my heart for today. It's a story well known among all parables. And yet the question is, how can a parable written 2,000 years ago affect us in, in today's life? That we will find out. Be with me, Lord, and we ask that our ears will be open, that we may hear, our eyes that we may see. A spirit that's willing to accept this spirit and share it as we leave this church building. Through Christ we pray, amen. The parable of the prodigal son is probably the most familiar and beloved of all the parables that Jesus spoke. When you would ask people, what is your favorite parable or which one do you remember? The prodigal, the, uh, per, uh, the prodigal son would be uh, it. It is one of the longest and most detailed parables. And unlike most parables, it has more than one lesson. The Greek word for prodigal means dissolute and conveys the idea of utter an utterly debauched lifestyle. But the prodigal son is also an example of sound repentance of turning his life around. The elder brother illustrates the wickedness of the Pharisees, self-righteousness, prejudice and indifference toward repenting sinners. And at the end of the story, when the younger son came back, the older son was livid. He was not a happy camper, and thus he represents the Pharisees. And the father of this story pictures God and his grace. The father was eager to forgive and longing for the return of his son. It is interesting that all three parables in this chapter, now three in chapter 15, are known by their negative rather than their positive features. We've got the lost sheep, not the found sheep. We've got the lost coin, but not the found corn. And the prodigal son, but not the loving father. The theme of being lost is consistent with the two former parables. And I find it interesting that the fact that all three of these parables start in a negative form, a negative instance, but they all end up with joy, with joy, celebrations of joy. The found sheep, the found coin, and the found son. The parable of the prodigal son is a parable of love, forgiveness, and joy. It's interesting to note that twice in this parable, verse 24 and verse 32, it said that the younger son was dead and is alive and was lost and is, and is found. And maybe as I go through today's message, we can say, how are we like the younger son? How are we like the younger son? And how is a father like God our father? So today's title is, When the Grass Isn't Always Greener. You've heard this term, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Well, not necessarily. That's true. Uh, I looked on the uh, Google and there's all kinds of neat stuff like, uh, the reason the grass is greener on the other side of the fence is because it's artificial turf. Uh, but the point is, when we look on the other side of the fence and it's always green or greener, it's because we're looking through our eyes, not necessarily through the eyes of God. So when we find that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, does it mean that we have failed? When we find out that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, does it mean we failed? But failures, failures can be a stepping stone to success. 
It depends on how we view our failures. This story is about a father full of grace and forgiveness. I mean, think about it. If your son came up to you and said, you know, I want my inheritance now. How many in this church body would say, fine, you write out a check? I mean, I once made a joke to my dad. And I said, hey, well, just give me my money now. Watch me enjoy it. He smiled, but he wasn't impressed. But I was joking also. But you look at this father, and you look at how he responded. You look at how he responded. Again, this story is about a father full of grace and forgiveness and a young man who failed. But this young man's failure wasn't the end of him. Instead, his failures set the stage for greater and better things to come in his life. So sometimes when we have negative experiences, it's to get us to where God wants us to be. You look at, you look at Job, for instance, or uh, what he went through. He went through a lot of negative stuff, but in the end, he was okay. You look at Jonah. Jonah rebelled, and look where he ended up. A lot of people say the big fi uh, the well, but the Bible doesn't say the well, a big fish. But again, Jonah had to go through his trials and tribulations to get to where God wanted him, which was Nineveh. So we know this young man as a prodigal son or the lost son, and it shows up he shows us how we can find the greener grass, although he went a long way around to get to the greener grass. So the question is, what did his son want? What did the younger son want from his father? He wanted freedom. To be entirely free and to be his own master. He wanted his freedom, so he made a selfish request to his father. In verse 12, he says, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. He's asking for his inheritance now. Another way to say this is he's wishing that his father was dead because normally your father would pass before you got your inheritance. So by, by him asking, say, I want my inheritance now, what the younger son was saying, basically, Dad, I wish you was really dead so I could spend your money. That is a shocking request. Because he was not entitled to any of the, his inheritance while he was still alive. Now, what's interesting is the father's response. I mentioned a little bit earlier, if our son or daughter would ask for their inheritance now, how would we respond to be truthful? Would you all write, come out and write a checkbook saying, hey, I understand, peace? I don't think so. So how did his father respond the father graciously fulfilled the request, giving him his full portion. Which again, would have been one third of the estate. The father didn't lecture his son. Do you read any place in this prayer where the father said, now this is not one of your brightest ideas, son. You don't read that, do you? The father didn't lecture his son that he was making a big mistake. And his father knew it. But the father did as his son asked. As soon as the younger, the younger son got his inheritance, he went happily on his way. In fact, the Bible says in verse 13, the young man gathered everything together. It seems like the younger son was leaving home with no intentions of coming back. He was going to have the high life. In verse 13, we read, the younger son wanted to go to a distant country. Uh, in those days, it'd be uh, Rome or Antioch, maybe for us, San Francisco or San Diego. That, that'd be a good example. Not saying they're bad cities, but it'd be like going to another country for us. Now, this is an image of the sinner's deep apostasy from God. This picture's a sinner apart from God. In other words, God, I want it my way. It's what I call the Burger King Christian. Because when you see the Burger King advertisements, what do they say? You can have it your way. And that's what this son was saying. He said, Dad, I want it my way. I want it my way. 
The younger son wanted to start a new life, to be on his own, to do his own thing. That attitude describes many people in today's society. They can't wait to get away from the rules and regulations of life. They want to live on their own and do their own thing, and sometimes our children are like that. They think, once I get on my own, life is going to be a piece of cake. And then eventually reality hits them, in a, uh, hits them and slaps them in the face. They say, I can do what I want. No one's going to tell me what to do. I can get up when I want, and I can go to bed when I want. If I don't want to get up and go to church, then I don't have to. I'm the master of my destiny. Many people follow this man's path. Rejecting God, rejecting the Bible, and rejecting the church. In verse 13, we read that the younger, the younger son indeed go to a distant land. And when he got there, what did he do? He wasted his estate in loose living. Now, we can imagine the kind of life he was living, even in those days. But it would not be the way the brethren folks would be living. I'll, let's, let's put it that way. I think we might be living it differently. Have you ever thought about that? sin is fun? Sin is fun. That's why we do it. That's why we do it. If sin wasn't fun, we probably wouldn't do it. That's why sin comes so natural for some. But sin, but sin carries severe consequences, as this young man was about to find out. He's about to find out his rebellion from his father was going to cost him. And in Luke 14, 25, it talks about counting the cost. This son did not count the cost. He did not count the cost. So let's start off, well, as I mentioned, fun is only temporary. The party doesn't last. What was fun now leads to pain, suffering, and ultimately his death in a way. What does Paul say in Romans 3, 23? For the wages of sin is death. So regardless of our decisions in life, our party will end. So let's talk about his failure. Start off with his failure. The younger son misused his freedom and spent all his inheritance. And then something unexpected happened. The Bible says in verse 14, a severe famine occurred in a land and he became poor. He became poor. You see, this young man went from the penthouse to the outhouse. And there's a lesson for us, to, uh, for us to learn here. As we go through life, expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. God has a plan and purpose for our life. Did you realize that? God has a plan and purpose for our lives. So the question is, are we willing to surrender and submit to God, to God's will for our lives? And when we, when we do submit to God's will, we need to expect the unexpected. In verse 14, the young man began to be in need, which, uh, you know, uh, no doubt, he's got no money. Another term would say, he went bankrupt. Now here's an interesting question. Where were all his party friends? You know, the ones who ate with him, the ones who partied with him, you know, the ones who celebrated with him? Where, where are they at? You know, they drank with him, they helped him blow his inheritance. Where did they go? The younger son found out that when the party was over, his so-called friends were over also. At this stage in his life, 
The younger son was a first class failure. Morally, ethically, financially, and I'd even say spiritually. But as we go through life, we need to face up to our failures. We all will fail in life. So the question is, will we fare, fail in life? The question is, will we face our failures? The question was now, what was a younger son going to do? Was he going to face his failure? Was he going to ignore this failure, saying, this will pass? Or would he blame others for his failures and problems? He had three choices. What would the younger son say? Well, if I had known the famine was going to come, I wouldn't spend all my money. It was my dad's fault. He should not have written me that check. He should have known better. He's older than I was. He's wiser than I am. It's all his fault. I'm just a young kid, and I didn't know any better. He should have taught me how to manage my money better. Or, ah, it's my friend's fault. They used me and they took advantage of me. So the question is, would he give up or quit? Would he give up and quit? What's the use? I made such a mess out of my life. There's no hope for me. Or would he say, man, I messed up really big this time. How could I have been so stupid? This is my fault. This is all my fault. And I'm going to get help. But, there's always a but in life. He still wanted to be the master of his own destiny. He still wanted to be what I call the big cheese. He still has some pride and arrogance. So the failures continued in his life. He hired himself out to work for a citizen in that country. But the job he got was to what? Feed pigs. Yippee, I kind of talked about that last week. You know, pig pens and cow stalls. So what's the big deal? You know, feeding pigs, feeding cows. You know, a job's a job, right? So no big deal. Exactly, but for a Jew. This was one of the most degrading and humiliating tasks one could do, especially if he was a Jewish man. The Old Testament law strictly prohibited a Jew from having any contact with pigs because they were unclean animals. To eat swine was to become like a Gentile, and heaven forbid a Jew become like a Gentile. And he was outside the covenant, found in Leviticus. Again, think about the most disgusting job that we could do. Like I said last week, shoving manure. I mean, how many of you, be honest with me, how many of you woke up this morning and says, man, I sure wish I could go out in a pig pen and shovel manure. That's exactly what I want to do today. We can see the desperation on this young man's face. He would have gladly filled his stomach with pods that the swine were eating. He was at a stage that he's willing to eat the same food that he was feeding the pigs. Now the pods referred to in verse 16 were long pods of the carob tree eaten by animals and at times by the extremely poor people.
people. So what this younger son has just done he has labeled himself as the poorest of the poor. And I bet he didn't have ketchup and mustard appeared on the pods either. So you probably get him raw. No one, not even, his, not even his newfound friends, were giving him anything to eat. Now comes the most important part of this story. As you read the prodigal son, this is the most important part of the story. Because again, the prodigal son, the father represents God, and we represent, we represent the younger sons, the younger son. When he came to his senses, that's what you call in today's term, he had a light bulb moment, you know, or a bell that ding, 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 ding. Or the light, you know, the light bulb above the head, the light bulb goes up, goes on. He came to his senses. And when the young man came to his senses, the mind drifted back to the thoughts of home, his father, and most importantly, his father's love. It was then, we might say, the Beatitudes kicked in. Have you ever read this before and associated the Beatitudes with a younger son? Now, to be honest with you, I didn't. I read a commentary. I go, wow, I had a ding, ding, ding moment. Listen, to this, uh, Matthew 5, 30, uh, 3 and 6, uh, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for thee they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You see, the son didn't know at that moment, when he came to his senses, the Beatitudes was going to kick in. The son said, What am I doing here? I'm a fool. My father's servants have plenty to eat, and I'm starving to death. You know, I'm eating pods that pigs eat. Then a young son made the most important decision in his life. And that's like us. When we stray from the church, when we stray, stray, stray from our faith, he decided to return to his father. The young man said, I will get up and go to my father. Now, that is symbolizes our Heavenly Father, which is what it's telling us. I will go back to my Father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in this case, God. And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Now, so he got up and came to his Father. Now, make me, it's interesting, make me... This petition indicates a complete change in attitude. When he left home, he said, give me, give, 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 give me. He left with a selfish demand. He returned home with a humble prayer, make me. The Son shows us how to view and how to respond to our failures. And we're all going to have failures. It's going to happen. He took responsibility for his actions. He admitted to his, to his sin and failure to his father. He put away his pride and arrogance. And he was willing to accept the consequences for his actions. Forgiveness. As a son headed for home, what was his father adoring? Have you ever noticed this? I'm sure you've read the prodigal son various times. As a son was heading back home, what was his father doing? The Bible says in verse 20, the father was looking for his son. And when we stray from the church and when we stray from our, our faith, our father is always looking for us. Is always looking for us. While the son was still far away, the father saw him and ran to him. Now I'm going to give you this, this bit of information. I'm not going to charge you. This is a freebie. Did you realize that it was not cool for an old man to run? 
That was degrading. That was humiliating. They just didn't do that. But yet his father ran to his son. Because his son's love was more important than what people thought. The father hugged his son, and the son confessed to his father. And the father responded with grace and love and forgiveness. And when we have our children go astray, and they come home, we need to respond the same way. We need to respond in love and compassion. The father put on a robe on his son, a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and ordered a fattened calf to be killed. Now, you only killed a fattened calf when you're going to party or celebrate. So what his father was about to do was celebrate. Celebrate. Because they were going to have a party. As mentioned, the father and the prodigal son represents God. And the younger son represents us. And when we come back to our father, we're going to get a big hug. Because this story is about love, grace, mercy, hope, restoration, forgiveness, salvation. What more can you ask for? God in his love, grace, and mercy gives us freedom to live however we want. We are not puppets. Why do we do bad things? Because God has given us free will. We are not puppets. We are not puppets. And we can reject God and do our own thing if that's what we want to do. And when we do things on our own and reject, reject God, there are consequences to our actions. The story tells us that when we reject God, that we will bring pain, suffering, trouble, problems, failures, and destruction into our lives. When we wonder, God is looking for us and waiting for us to return to him. He is. By admitting our sins, mistakes, and failures, and turning away from them, we got to admit our wrongdoings. And when we do that, God is ready and willing to receive us in forgiveness. And there's another beautiful aspect to this story. The younger son got more from his father than he, than he expected or that he deserved. The younger son only wanted to become one of his father's servants. But he got much more than that. Each of the father's gifts says something unique about his acceptance. The robe was only reserved for the guest of honor. His son was a guest of honor. The ring was a symbol of authority and marked the position of sonship. The sandals, these were not usually worn by slaves and therefore signified his full restoration to sonship. The son was fully restored into a right relationship with his father. With all the blessings and benefits of a son, Brothers and sisters, we must remember God gives us far more than what, we, than what we expect or what we deserve. Again, God gives us much more than we expect or deserve. When he returned home to his father, the young son found life. In being restored to a right relationship with his father, the young son received love, mercy, joy, peace, hope, freedom, forgiveness. But most importantly, his son found life. And the same can happen to us. Our fulfillment is not found in money, fame, status, possessions, pleasures, or prestige. 
Our fulfillment is only found in a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we were made by God and we were made for God in Colossians. And until we understand that we, until we understand that, we will experience failures in our lives. But this story has a happy ending. Twice in this parable, it said the younger son was dead, but he's, he's alive now. And that's a good thing. In Luke 15, 24, the father says, The son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. That's you and that's me. Until we come home to our heavenly father in love, repentance, faith, trust, and obedience, then too we are dead and lost. So as I wrap up this morning's message, what does this story have to do with us? We've just read the prodigal, the prodigal son. What does it have to do with us? What does it have to do with the Pittsburgh Church of the Brethren? Simple. No failure is fatal. No failure is final. Every failure is an opportunity for us to learn and to grow. God and only God can take our failures and bring something good out of them. God loves us and God wants us. God is relentless and God is tireless. God is always on the lookout for us and ready to receive us when we come home. Ready to forgive, ready to heal, restore and bless and to use us in his ministry. With Jesus Christ in our lives, we can be sure that when we fail, again, with Jesus Christ in our lives, we can be sure that when we fail, we will always find the greener grass. Amen.